Hi there, my name is Aaron Lanchman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. In the last couple of lectures, we've started to look at Z transforms. In this video, we'll see how Z transforms can give us insight into the frequency domain behavior of finite impulse response filters. Although, as we'll see later, the general ideas also apply to infinite impulse response filters. Here we have the formula for the Z transform of an impulse response of a causal FIR filter of order m. We call the resulting Z transform either a system function or a transfer function. Z is a generic complex number that we can express in polar form. If we look at the particular case where r equals 1, then we see that as we sweep around theta here, that would correspond to sweeping the unit circle. And recalling the frequency response of an FAR filter, we see that we get the frequency response by just plugging in e to the j omega hat in for z. So thinking about this relationship, the frequency omega hat corresponds to the angle the vector makes in the complex plane. Now, don't get this mixed up with the kind of function of time spinning phasers we looked at previously. Now, in the case of FIR filters, there's this nice correspondence between the impulse response h of n and the filter coefficients b sub k. For IIR filters, that gets more complicated. We'll look at that later. We will often characterize system functions according to the locations of their poles and zeros. The zeros of a system function are the location z on the complex plane where the system function is zero. So in this example, we might set 1 minus 1 half z to the minus 1 equal to 0. I could multiply both sides here by z and find that there's a 0 at 1 half. We'll typically plot the zeros using these little circles. To be a little more formal, we might think of this as a ratio of 1 minus 1 half z to the minus 1 over 1. So now we can multiply the numerator and the denominator by z to put it in this form, and we can more readily talk about poles. So poles are the locations on the complex plane where the magnitude of the frequency response blows up to infinity as you approach the pole. So in this particular case, we have a pole at the origin, and we indicate poles with these little x's. To think about the effect of the zeros on the frequency response, imagine being a little ant and crawling along the unit circle with angles going between 0 and pi. And you could also think about an ant crawling this direction with angles going from 0 to minus pi. At any given point, whatever angle the ant is making corresponds to evaluating the frequency response at the frequency associated with that angle. And what the ant does is they look around and they look at the zeros nearby. If there's a 0 nearby that's close to the unit circle, that will pull down the magnitude of the frequency response a lot. If there's a zero that's further away, it will have less of an effect. Later, we'll see that poles will tend to pull up the frequency response. But since this pole is sitting at the origin, so it's the same distance from the unit circle at all of the angles, it doesn't really have an effect. In particular, something interesting happens when a zero is exactly on the unit circle. Here I have an FIR filter with coefficients 1, minus 2, 2, minus 1. In general, factoring a cubic polynomial can be a pain, but this particular polynomial has a structure where we can factor it as 1 minus e to the minus 1 times this polynomial here. So we have 1, 0 at 1. If I plug in 1 here, this turns into 0. And then I can use the quadratic formula on this to find a couple of other zeros. Now, assuming that your impulse response is real valued, you always have the structure where if there are complex zeros, they'll show up as complex conjugate pairs. The same principle will hold for poles. So here we have 1 half plus or minus j squared of 3 over 2. And we can get that by applying the quadratic formula to this after multiplying everything by z cubed. Now, converting this to polar form, we see that we have angles of plus and minus pi over 3, but the magnitude is 1, 
So these zeros all lie on the unit circle. Now the poles of FIR filters are not that interesting. I can imagine taking this and dividing it by one and then multiplying the numerator and the denominator by z cubed. And we'll say that there's three poles at zero. So when we plot this, we'll put a little three next to the x here to indicate there are three poles. And we'll do the same thing for zeros if there's multiple zeros at the same location. Here the three zeros are going to have an important effect on the frequency response, but the three poles at the origin are not that important. Now later when we look at IIR filters, and we can put poles in places that are not the origin, we'll see that those are very important. These zeros are particularly interesting because they lie on the unit circle, and zeros that lie on the unit circle will perfectly kill off frequencies they are associated with. And we can see that in this frequency domain plot. You'll see that the magnitude at those three points, including this point here at DC, goes all the way down to zero. Notice that it goes up at pi and minus pi. And that makes sense because if you look at it in the Z plane, you'll see that over here around pi or equivalently around minus pi, we're far away from those zeros. Now, in this range in here, and in this range in here, you're under the influence of a couple of zeros and the effects of the zeros combine. So you'll see that you don't have a whole lot of signal getting through here or here. In EC2026, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time talking about phase plots. Just notice that in this particular case, we have these jumps of pi in phase at the places where the frequency response magnitude is zero. Let's double check that nulling property algebraically. Here I have the system function. To get the frequency response, we plug in e to the j omega hat. Now at dc, when I plug in omega hat equals zero, this goes away, this goes away, and this goes away. Well, I guess there's a one here. So I have one minus two plus two minus one. That all adds up to zero. So that all checks out. Now suppose I put in a complex sinusoid with a frequency of pi over three. So we know that we can get the output by taking the same complex sinusoid and multiplying it by the frequency response evaluated at the frequency of pi over three. So we need to find out what that is. Here's the frequency response written out again in general form. If we plug in pi over three for omega hat, we wind up with this expression. And then if we convert these complex exponentials to a rectangular form, we can see that a bunch of stuff winds up canceling and we wind up with zero. In the next lecture, we'll look at a particular example of designing a nulling filter.